It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants huddle podcast. This week, we're going to talk to Giants rookie offensive tackle Evan Neal. We're going to talk to Joe Person, who covers the Panthers for The Athletic. And Bob Papa sits down for his weekly chat with Giants head coach Brian Dable. But first, everybody, a reminder. The Giants Huddle Podcast can be found on your favorite podcast platforms at Giants.com slash podcast and on the Giants mobile app. Make sure you go and subscribe and check out our other podcast offerings as well, including draft season, our draft podcast. We've had one episode in August already previewing the college football season. We'll have another one coming your way at the end of September. All right, let's get to it, folks. We're going to lead off with my conversation with Giants rookie right tackle Evan Neal. Evan, let's start here. You had a chance to you know look over the tape of your first game. How do you think you did? I feel like I had a pretty good showing. Um, nothing's ever perfect. You know, you go back and watch the film and analyze the things you did wrong and, you know, try to grow from the things, you know, you did pretty good at. But uh, overall, uh, I made more mistakes than I wanted to. But uh, it was the first game. I mean, I have another game this week to come out and get better. But I feel like I performed well enough to help the team win. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Was it a big difference from what you experienced in the preseason? Was it a little bit faster, a little bit more physical, or was it just a little bit more of the same? Yeah, I can definitely say it's a little bit more faster, a little bit more physical, you know, uh, going up against first-team guys and, you know, they're bringing their absolute uh, best pass rush moves and, and uh, like that. So it was definitely a good experience. It was definitely fun. Anything surprise you that maybe you weren't expecting, just in terms of the rhythm of the day, getting ready, warm-ups, halftime, anything just about that regular season experience catch you by surprise at all? No, nothing about the regular season uh, process really caught me by surprise. It pretty, was, pretty much was uh, – Pretty much spot on, you know, pregame, like what I did for Alabama and what I did here is pretty much spot on. I mean, not surprised Alabama run, basically runs a pro program down there. I'm not surprised by that. Once you got done with all the offseason training stuff, I know you didn't do a lot at the combine, but so much of that offseason draft preparation isn't necessarily football training, right? It's kind of preparing for the draft process. Once you got done with that, what was that transition like for you going from the draft process preparation to actually trying to get ready to play football? Yeah, it was like I was excited, you know, because uh, drive it, the drive process it isn't football. You're trying to run the shuttle, do the forty, and lifting weights and stuff like that. You know, so you didn't really have time to get better as a ball player. So uh, definitely coming out the OTAs and you know the summer and stuff like that and uh, fall camp is a uh, definitely great a great feeling because you know I got the, got the chance to go back out there and just hone my skills and just get better as an offensive lineman. What was your focus this off season? Once you started doing that stuff, where were you trying to improve yourself? Yeah, I just wanted to get, you know, uh, uh, bigger, faster, stronger, uh, more flexible, better flexibility, and uh, also just work on my technique, you know, just just, uh, just try to refine my game overall. You mentioned your technique, and we had long conversations with Andrew Thomas about this when he was a rookie a couple years back. And the technique they used to block as a line was different here than it was at Georgia. How much different was the overall technique as a line and as an individual that they're asking you to do here with the Giants compared to what you did at Bama? Um, it's not entirely different. I mean, the thing with me, man, it's not so much the scheme where they're asking us to do opposed to college or here because, I mean, offensive line players <laughs> keep the quarterback up right and open up running lanes for the running back. It's just the fact of, uh, you know, I kind of, I played three different positions in college, so I never got the opportunity to really, you know, hone in on one spot, you know, because I was just bouncing around so much. So it's just a great opportunity for me to be able to just stick at right tackle and hone my skills at right tackle, so I'm excited. This year, your last season was left tackle at Alabama, so – did you fall back into a rhythm pretty quickly? Did it take some time to get used to reversing that footwork back to what you did? How much of a transition was that for you? Oh, yeah, it took a little time. Um, but I, I had played left tackle uh, my senior year in uh, high school, so it came back to me. But, um, like, I, I feel like I was just a versatile, talented guy, so I could, uh, you know, play on any spot and I could, you know, um, just do well. But, um, like, Technically, like as far as my technique was, even if you, you know watch some of my take at Alabama at left tackle, my technique wasn't the greatest or the best that I wanted it to be. But I could go out there and perform uh, good enough to you know help myself do well and help the team do uh, do well also. You know, so uh, I'm just excited to really hone in on one spot and just perfect it. Yeah, and it's funny when we were talking to Andrew and he was a rookie. You know, he talked about how at Georgia a lot of times they would slide, so he would always have inside help, right? So when he got to the pros, he was on a little bit more of an island, and he's had some issues getting beat inside early because he said, look, at Georgia, I always had a guy there if the guy made an inside move on me. So anything like that in terms of differences of just how they put the production together as a team, so maybe they're asking you to do 
some things that are different here compared to Alabama, or was it really much more of a smooth transition for you? Yeah, it was pretty smooth. I was on the island at Alabama, uh, for sure. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm used to being on an island. Um, so, yeah, it really wasn't much of a transition uh, to that regard. You know? What was did, did Andrew give you good advice, you know, talking to you about what it was like coming in as a young tackle, being asked to play right away, and, and how to make that transition and, and be effective right away, kind of getting thrown into the deep end of the pool? Yeah, we didn't uh, have that conversation in specific, but Andrew's always just asking me to, you know, take extra passes with him after practice or, you know, uh, just evaluate uh, rushers that we're going to play against uh, in the upcoming weeks and stuff like that and just, you know, doing, you know, everything he can to just give me little tidbits and bits and pieces that maybe helped him along the way. So I appreciate that. It seems like your guys' personalities and approaches are kind of similar. Do you feel like you guys, just you're kind of low-key, you're very serious, you're very professional, do you feel like you guys are kind of like two peas out of the same pot a little bit? Yeah, you could definitely say that. Uh, Andrew's a quiet guy, uh, much like myself, business-oriented, and uh, he's a hard worker, so I definitely could say that. Anything about either the college program you were at, the way you were raised or brought up, that has allowed you, because everyone has talked about how studious you are and how serious you are, and sometimes from rookies, they don't understand that's what it takes to be a really good pro, but you do. What is it about the way you were brought up and kind of taught football that has allowed you to apply that so quickly in the NFL? Yeah, I was raised up on hard work. Uh, my dad, he beat that in all of his kids. You know, you, in order to be successful at something, you know, you got to do the little things right and you have to work hard at it. And then going to a program like IMG, you know, those same principles were reinforced. Then at Alabama, they showed enough were uh, enforced because Coach Saban's all about, you know, the little things and, you know, doing what's right and doing your job for sure. So. What has it been like working with Glowinski next to you? It must be nice having a veteran next to you at right guard, right? You guys have to work together on the twists and the games and stuff. What has it been like working with Mark? It's awesome having Glow next to me. Uh, yeah, Glow, that's, that's my guy. He's always uh, helping me in uh, whatever way that he can, uh, stand after, you know, just watching film, breaking down film with me and stuff like that, and you know, just making sure I'm keyed in on the line calls and stuff like that. So I de- I'm definitely appreciative of Glow. Yeah, I love watching your approach. I'm going to go back to a snap that you had in one-on-ones against the Jets in the joint practice, and you're going against, I think it was John Franklin Myers, and he tried to bull rush you. And maybe he took you two steps back, he ended up anchoring, and he walked away, and he started talking to you. And he's, he's yapping, and as you walk away, you just flap your f- little fingers like this, like, keep talking, keep talking, I stop you, that, that, that's all I care about. Is that kind of a good representation of your approach and how you want to play? Yeah, man, I, I want to talk with my shoulder pads. Like, I, it takes too much energy to talk, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just being serious, you know. Uh, I, that's, that's not something that I have to do to be able to, you know. Some guys use talking to try to create an edge. Like, I never had to do that. Hey, man, just have your game to the talking. That, that's all you got to do. So you've been going against Ojolari and Thibodeau in practice. We don't know if they're going to play this week. We'll see. When they eventually do get on the field, what are Giant fans going to see, and what kind of issues are those guys going to give opposing defense, opposing offenses? Oh, they're going to put pressure on the quarterback. Just wait. I'm, I'm excited for those guys to get out there and just feed off of each other and put pressure on that quarterback. That, that's what we need, and I'm excited to go out there and watch them do it. Do you feel like you're a little further ahead in the run game or the pass game right now, or do you think they're about neck and neck? Um. I, to be quite honest with you, man, like overall, man, I, I feel like I need to get better all around. Like I'm really nowhere near where I really want to be or where I envision myself playing. But um, I, I can say, you know, what and what. I, I can't say that I'm a little better in one area or or the next because um, the th- some of the things that I do good at, you know, in pass protection, you know, in the run game, I may not do as good, you know. So I just kind of feel like, you know, I'm just I'm just focusing on getting better. That that's it. Just overall, just getting better. Do you like Bobby Johnson's coaching style? Every offensive lineman I've talked to said, look, he's straight up with you, and he's going to let you know, good or bad, what's going on. Do you like that? Yeah, I respect that, man. He's supposed to be straight up with people. You know, I, I don't believe in BSing. You know, I believe in, you know, a guy telling me the truth, and I, that's definitely something that uh, I respect about Coach Johnson, for sure. All right, let's talk about the opponent very quickly before we say goodbye. Panthers coming up here. They got a very talented pass rusher in Brian Burns. Uh, Uter Gross Matos from Penn State, I think second year in the league for him. What do you see from those pass rushers when you watch them on tape? Oh, they're a very fast defense. Uh, Brian Burns, very fast guy, elusive guy. Uh, he's long. He has a really good spin move. He can get up the field on you like right now. So I just want to make sure I stay square and inside out on that guy. But um, it, regardless of whatever it's going to take uh, to get the job done, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so I'm just excited to go out there and battle with him and just go to war. Now, you know the Panthers are going to be a little bit chippy after giving up 200 rushing yards last week. They're not going to want that to happen again. But you guys ran the ball extremely well in week one. So as an offensive line, is that like the perfect game for you where you can just pound it and pound it and pound it and that's how you move the ball up and down the field? 
Oh yeah, I mean the running game. Whenever you just pounding, pounding, and pounding, and pounding, and pounding like that, that wears on the defense, you know, and that opens up those big shots down the field, you know. So I just feel like it just kind of keeps those guys honest, you know. So uh, I definitely, definitely enjoy pounding the rock in the run game. Is there something different about doing it in the red zone? Because I feel like in order to score in the red zone, the space is so constricted, right? It's hard to throw in the red zone. But you guys, I think on your two red zone possessions, you score touchdowns. I think you ran it almost eight times and only passed it twice. And that's how you got in the end zone. Is there something a little bit different that you guys have to do or bring in order to run the ball effectively in the red zone in those condensed spaces? Yeah, there's a, there's obviously, like you said, there's less space in the run game for sure. So I just want to make sure you get half for a hat and just, you know, <laughs> Score, score with your guy. Score a touchdown with your guy for sure. Uh, um, Kafka did a good job of doing a lot of like the naked, uh, like play action, like sure. naked uh, bootlegs and stuff like that. And, you know, just different things. But um, definitely, we get in the red zone. I want to run the ball. You know, so everybody just get a hat for a hat and take that guy to the end zone. We are gonna score. We talked about the individual pass rushers. How much blitzing are they gonna do? Are they gonna run a lot of games, a lot of stunts, a lot of twists, a lot of linebackers? What are you gonna see in terms of their pressure packages? Yeah, I've saw that they've uh they do a lot of twists. They they don't really run a lot of twists or his games as uh Tennessee did in my opinion, but they do twist, they do move up front and they do pressure and they do blitz. But regardless of what they bring uh to us, I believe we're gonna be ready. The coaches are uh, definitely equipping us and giving us the best looking practice so we'll be be able to get it all picked up. Now finally, we don't want the crowd to be loud when you guys have the football, obviously. But are you excited to be in MetLife Stadium for your first regular season game in front of Giant fans? Extremely excited. It's my birthday weekend. You know, uh, yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you, man. It's extremely excited to go out there and just play our hearts out for the fans. Evan, best of luck. Congratulations on your first game and best of luck in your home opener. Thank you, man. Hey, Giant fans, make sure you're at MetLife Stadium for the next home game, September 26th. The Giants will host the rival Dallas Cowboys for Monday Night Football. A special Ring of Honor ceremony will take place during halftime. Limited individual and group tickets are still available. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat today. That's Giants right tackle Evan Neal. We thank him for joining us on the Giants Huddle Podcast. Now let's turn it over to Paul Dottino on Lance Meadow. They preview the Carolina Panthers with Joe Person, who covers them for The Athletic. The Giants welcome the Panthers to MetLife Stadium this weekend for their regular season opener. Both teams had their games decided by a last-second field goal in Week 1. And to get more into this matchup, we are now joined by the man who covers the Panthers for The Athletic, none other than Joe Person. Joe, you got Lance Meadow and Paul Dottino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Everything's good, man. We got football season cranking up. I'm um, going to be uh, heading up to New York. and I'm going to take in the West Point Villanova game on Saturday and then an NFL game Sunday. That's That's not so bad. Very nice. So a little bit of double dipping between college and the NFL. Well, we certainly appreciate you coming on. And I want to start in terms of Sunday's game for Carolina with Cleveland, Joe, because if you look at the optics, you look at the numbers, I don't even know if a tale of two halves is fitting. It was more of a tale of three quarters and one quarter based on what Carolina did in the fourth. So what exactly clicked? What registered late in the game that finally got that offense on track? You know, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. They, they, Matt Rule said that they really were just sort of, everyone was sort of speeding things up. And I think that was a, a, a function of, of the first game with Baker Mayfield, you know, remember, remember he came in here late, like they, he didn't, and then he didn't get many preseason uh, snaps, not as many as, as you would think because they extended the quarterback competition, you know, into the third week of the preseason. So he was sharing reps with Sam Darnold for the first month of training camp. So I do think a, a lot of it Sunday against the Browns was just kind of, as you said, it just wasn't clicking early on. An example, first play of the game, supposed to be a five-step drop. Baker Mayfield takes a three-step drop, throws the timing off. They had a lot of plays like that. Um, they had four fumbled snaps, which they somehow managed to recover all four of them. And uh, it, it, you're right. It took until that fourth quarter or, or late in the third till they started looking, especially offensively, like a uh, you know a, a, an NFL type of offense. You know, Joe, what surprised me about that game, and I'm sure it's going to have an impact on this week's game plan against the Giants, is that if you have a team trying to feel its way through, you usually lean on the one constant you have. 
And even though Christian McCaffrey's been injured the last couple of years, the guy only gets 14 touches in the game. I, I got to feel he's going to get at least 25 against Big Blue. Yeah, I didn't get that either. Uh, that, that was a head scratcher. It, the only thing I can think is that they were trying to save him for the second half. And, you know, they, they, they wouldn't say that. They haven't said that. But it, it just sort of had that feel. And I'll tell you what that did, too. It, it hurt them offensively, obviously, uh, for reasons I just mentioned. But it hurt them defensively, too, because there were all these three and outs early in the game for the Panthers' offense. And the defense, which is one of their, you know, it's kind of their strong suit, they were starting to wear down early in, in the game. It was sort of a hot day. They were on this artificial turf that the Panthers had put in uh, last season. And it all just added up to, to, to a bad strategy by Ben McAdoo, frankly. Um, I think that's going to change, as you said, and change in a pretty big way in getting Christian Mac McCaffrey involved early and often against the Giants. Joe McCaffrey, the play of Baker Mayfield, all synonymous, of course, as you can attest to from covering the NFL with the offensive line. And much like the Giants in previous years, Carolina's offensive line has been put under the microscope and they revamped that group this offseason. They drafted Icky Aquano in the first round. They brought in Bradley Bozeman as well as Austin Corbett in free agency. Two part question. Number one, how did you feel Aquanu held up in his first regular season action? And B, Bozeman, I know, missed some time during camp with an ankle injury, but did not play last week. It was Pat Elfline. How much do you think they have the conversation about reinserting Bozeman into the lineup this week? Yeah, so on Aquanu, it was a mixed bag, which I really kind of thought it, it was going to look like that. I mean, facing Miles Garrett, an all-pro in your first ever NFL game, he had some moments where he where he did pretty well against Miles Garrett. And there were times that they uh, they gave him a little help with some tight ends chipping on their way out. But then uh, there was a, a, a sequence in the in the second half, I think it was the third quarter, where Garrett beat Aquanu back to back plays for sacks, blind side hits, big hits. Uh, first one anyway on on Baker Mayfield. The second whip, second one, strip sacks. Baker fell on it. Um, so, I, listen, I, Icky Aquanu's pass blocking is a work in progress. Like his his deal at NC State, he was a physical mauler in the run game had all these pancake blocks. NC State had a deal where they'd give their linemen bottles of maple syrup. He, he collected, <laughs> collected. But pass blocking, as you guys know, like it's, it's, it's a different animal at this level with the sure. speed you see, with the, the, the moves, different moves in pass rush. You know, like college, Aquanu said, you're facing guys who had like one move. Not so much anymore. So that's a matchup to look at. And then Elfline, I think Pat Elfline will continue to be the center this week. I just think right now with the injury to Bradley Bozeman, he's healthy. I just think right now they, they feel like Elfline gives them their best chance to win in the middle, despite uh, those center, uh, quarter, center quarterback exchange problems last week. Robbie Anderson had the big 75-yard touchdown grab against Cleveland. D.J. Moore, one of the most underrated receivers in this league, had a quiet opening week uh, in the game against the Browns. What will we expect to see different from the passing game this week when you just mentioned the old lines in a bit of a flux and Baker Mayfield may not be fully comfortable with the offense yet? Yeah, I don't know there'll be a lot different. They just hope it's a lot more efficient, right? I, and, uh, guys, I went back and looked. It's a little bit apples and oranges because it's obviously a new system, a whole new team. But Baker Mayfield, his week two record in Cleveland was pretty impressive. He was – his rookie year, he didn't play uh, until week three. So throw that out. But then the next three years, he was 3-0 and in week two coming off Brown's losses uh, in, in the openers. And in each case, his passing yardage and or – uh, passer rating, and in some cases, both went up. So, again, 
how much to make of that. I, I don't know. I mean, but, but <laughs> listen, after the Panthers offense, uh, the way they played last week, they'll, they'll take any glimmer of hope. And, and I do think they're trying to rally around that fourth quarter and, you know, Matt rule sort of playing around a little bit with stats this week saying like, Hey, if you take just the last 25 minutes of that game, we averaged 7.7 7 yards of uh, play, which would have been third in the league. Well, okay. Well, the, the first 35 <laughs> minutes count also. Um, but my point is, you know, there, there were some signs in that game, but you know, you mentioned Robbie Anderson get, getting behind the Browns defense. They got to get DJ Moore on track and they absolutely have to get Christian McCaffrey a bunch more touches. We're talking with Joe Person, who covers the Carolina Panthers for the Athletic Giants, hosting the Panthers in their regular season home opener this weekend. You brought up statistics, and if I heard correctly, Joe, one of the stats that Matt Rule brought up when he spoke to the media this week was 18 missed tackles on defense, which it's not a surprise based on that, why the Browns ran the ball so effectively. But now they have to deal with Saquon Barkley, who clearly had a field day at the expense of Tennessee last week. What do you attribute to the missed tackles? Is that a product of what you were talking about, Baker and the offense, not enough guys playing in the preseason? And how do they go about cleaning that up? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of that and the fact that the Browns have a couple of really good running backs, just as the Giants do, uh, in, in the persons of Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And it seemed like Chubb would get a little tired, in comes these fresh legs of Kareem Hunt and vice versa. But, but still inexcusable to have that many missed tackles you know how do you clean it up i mean i that that's scheme wise i'm not exactly sure what bill snow will do i i think he likes the personnel he might try to get what one guy to keep an eye on potentially is they signed henry anderson uh whom, whom the the patriots had had waived injured and he signed him specifically the the veteran defensive end to to be a run stuffer and he was on the field some last week but they might try to get him a little more involved just because he has that sort of setting the edge pedigree and might hold up uh better than some of their kind of leaner uh edge rusher types but uh but other than that they just got to hope and think that they're gonna kind of swarm to the ball a little better and have a couple guys rather than one trying to bring down Saquon Barkley. Let me ask you about this pass rush because they allowed Hassan Reddick to escape to Philadelphia uh, via free agency, and I, it's just not that easy to replace double-digit sacks. Are, are they going to ask too much of Brian Burns to do it all by himself? Feels like it. Yeah, I mean, the, right at the beginning of training camp, their general manager, Scott Fitter, who was actually a, a, a long time ago, have spent one year as an area scout with the Giants. Nevertheless, Fitterer said very clearly he thought they needed another edge rusher and kind of kept waiting. They talked that they had brought Carlos Dunlap in for a visit. He goes to Kansas City. You know, they were kind of talking to some other guys and they didn't, didn't do it. Like they're trying to kind of do it by committee. Uh, they have a guy who's in his fourth year named Marquise Haynes, who's been a situational pass rusher. But yeah, that was a problem last week. I mean, uh, you know, as much as the run game was a problem, I mean, still, I think Brissett threw it like 34 times. So they had ample opportunity to, to try to go after him. And I think they had one sack and came on a blitz from, from their linebacker, Damian Wilson. So yeah, right now, to me, it's just too easy if you are an opposing coach or coordinator to say, all right, who do we need to take away in this Panthers defense? And it's Brian Burns. And beyond that, there's not a whole lot that scares you. And so I think Burns is going to face a bunch of, of chip blocks and occasional double teams until uh, somebody like Marquise Haynes or Etor Gross Matos or even uh, former Jet Frankie Louvu steps up. Speaking of the pieces on defense, Joe, I want to turn to the secondary because as you brought up, even though the numbers weren't overwhelming in terms of the Browns passing attack, Jacoby Brissett still put the ball in the air a high volume of times. And this was the first test really for J.C. Horn to get back in the mix because 
He missed the bulk of last season with a fractured foot. How did he hold up for his first action in quite some time? And I guess overall, since this is year three of Phil Snow's scheme, how much is this show me time really for this unit, given the fact that for the most part, there is some continuity on that side of the ball? Yeah. So on the horn piece first, um, he held up fine physically. I mean, on that foot that, that he had broken last year, he had a couple of defensive holding penalties, one of which, well, I mean, both extended a drive, but one was a little costlier than the other. And he is sort of a grabby, handsy type of corner. That was, he had a lot of penalties coming out of South Carolina. I mean, that, and that's sort of his style. That is his style. He's a big physical kid. So they can live with some of that. But, um, you know, there, there, there is sort of that fine line between, okay, that's his style. And, man, that just that, – that really hurt us, that drive. So, but it, in terms of Phil Snow and the, and the defense overall, they were, they, they were the second-ranked defense last year overall in terms of yards allowed. It was a little bit, a little bit misleading, only because they gave up a bunch of points the second yep. half of the year. So, and some of that was short fields or what have you, but they weren't real good in the red zone, and uh, and they were not, and and they got gashed several times in the in the run game, including by the Giants. Uh, the Giants, Washington, and Dallas all got them pretty good. Actually, it might not have been the Giants. I think I'm thinking of Minnesota. But nevertheless, that they have some pieces. They've invested on the defense. You mentioned the secondary. They've got a couple first-round picks back there in, in C.J. Henderson and J.C. Horn. They've got two second-round picks in Dante Jackson and Jeremy Chin. There's first-round picks you know, up front with Shaq Thompson and Brian Burns and Derek Brown. It is show-me time. I mean, they, they're hoping – to be able to lean on that defense and uh and last week again i think they might have leaned on them a little too much early in that game but but the defense has to step up as well i love uh johnny hector's ability to tilt the field and of course they picked him up in free agency and then eddie pinheiro comes in very late as the place kicker but the one big missing component is now andre roberts in that kick return game hurting his knee and going on ir uh, he's about as good as they come and has been for several years. How are they going to deal with that? So they're going to have backup running back Chuba Hubbard return kicks, which he did some last year as a rookie and did okay. Um, he, he, you know, and I don't, he, he did okay. And punt return is another second round uh, kid, uh, former South Carolina wide receiver, Shy Smith. It was sort of a surprise in training camp. He 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 really played his way into the rotation. He he's their starting slot guy right now. Over he's a six round pick. Over last year's second round pick, Terrace Marshall Jr. And uh, even he 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 even beat out Rashard Higgins, who came sort of with Cle with Baker from Cleveland, and we really saw those two have a lot of chemistry. Anyway, back to your point. Shai Smith has done some punt returning also, uh, I think in college, but that's, yeah, they, they lose something there. And I think, I think for this first game without Andre Roberts, I think they're going to be okay. If Shai Smith just is, is fair catching the ball and, and not turning it over. And if he gives them some positive yards or happens to, to, you know, break off a 15 yard return, then that's gravy. I mean, he's a fast kid. Like, don't get me wrong, but, um, but Andre Roberts went healthy, and and that was a bit of a risk of a of a signing, right, guys? I mean, thirty four year old guy, you're kind of inviting the possibility of this happening, and unfortunately for Andre Roberts, it it happened right out of the chute. Joe, before we let you go, I want to circle back to Baker Mayfield because I brought this up last week when we were talking about the Giants Tennessee matchup, how. Ryan Tannehill and the Titans had some experience going up against Wink Martindale's Baltimore's defense. And now we have Wink trying to solve Baker Mayfield, who he's gone up against twice a year for each of the last four seasons, given they were in the same division. 
I'm curious what you think about that matchup and whether or not Baker has a slight edge because of his familiarity or Wink, given the Giants' defense is still a little bit of the unknown. Yeah, it's a great question. And it, it, we, we asked sort of a similar question last week of Baker and Matt Rule because Baker was facing the Browns, who has a very uh, <laughs> intimate knowledge of, of, of Baker Mayfield's pluses and minuses and his tendencies. And, you know, I, I, I think that the, where we saw it last week, and you, you can believe that Wink's telling the Giants the same thing, is batted passes. I mentioned the fumbles. The other problem with Baker last week was four batted passes at the line of scrimmage. And and that's, listen, it's not a new problem for Baker. I mean, he, he came into this year having thrown more of those, those tip balls at the line than any other quarterback since 2018 when he entered the league. And, but, but it really manifested itself last, last week. And Baker said the same thing to us this week. He said, look, I know what, what they're telling the Giants in that building. You see my feet stop, then get your hands up. And he's got to do a better job of sort of sliding his feet, getting into, you know, creating a, a, a passing lane. And then the line's got to do a better job of, of, of when you see those hands go up, it's sort of you turn into run blocking mode. Like you, you have to, and it's, that, that's a tough transition. Like I get it, but you're going from pass blocking and, and those hands go up and you got to fire into those guys and sort of, if you can't get their hands down just by grabbing them, then you sho- try to shove them at least and kind of get them off balance a little bit. But that was a problem. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of scheme things that Wink has up his sleeve too that, that you know what we'll see on Sunday but I but I think the batted passes it would be an interesting thing to look at uh as it was a problem last week and certainly Wink Martindale is well aware of that history with Baker so the game of chess ensues this week as the Giants open their regular season home slate against the Panthers at MetLife Stadium he is Joe Person who covers Carolina for the Athletic Joe can't thank you enough Greatly appreciate the time and the insight, and we look forward to seeing you in East Rutherford this weekend. Thanks, Joe. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Hey, Giant fans. The Giants' official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and, of course, on the Giants mobile app. That's Joe Person from The Athletic. We thank him for previewing the Carolina Panthers with Lance and Paul. Now let's turn our attention to Bob Papa and his weekly chat with Giants head coach Brian Dable. The Giants kick off their home schedule against the Carolina Panthers. 98th season of Giants football. Big Blue with a big win last week in Tennessee against the Titans. Panthers coming off a loss at home to Cleveland last week. And we're joined as always by the head coach of the New York football Giants, Brian Dable. And coach... It's your first Sunday as the head coach of the Giants for a home game. How pumped up are you for this experience? Yeah, we're really excited. You know, we we got our feet wet here in the first game against Tennessee on the road, and it's always good to play in front of your home crowd. I know the players are are anxious to get out here and uh, look forward to the opportunity. Coach, um, you know, just going back to last week quickly, um, you know, one of the things that you preached since you took over was, you know, work ethic, Work, 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 character, uh, team building. And it really felt like all of those things manifested itself in that game last week. Because let's face it, at halftime, the numbers aren't looking great, but the game is still within reach. Did some of what you've been trying to instill here with the Giants sort of show itself last week? Absolutely. I I thought the, the captains did a really good job on the sideline of just telling the players to play the next play. That's something that we stress a lot. Um, a bad play, flush it, a good play, flush it, team accountability, support one another and play for, for 60 minutes. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of good examples that came from that, that first game. And, you know, we tried to build off of it this week of practice and and we're going to need it uh, today. Coach, uh, obviously for those that have never been a head coach, uh, it's a constant game of shuffle, so to speak. Uh, you know, you're getting injury reports and all these other things. I mean, Aaron Robinson comes out of the game clean. 
uh, but then he has to have appendicitis uh, and an appendectomy. So um, is that just one of the challenges that you know you deal with during the course of every week as a head coach? Yeah, absolutely. Roster management, you know, who's up, who's down, injuries, and sometimes those injuries, like you said, are, are not football related at times. And you know that's why you, you take your time and you pick the players you want to be on your roster and, and your practice squad. Those are vital spots, and, and everybody's got to be ready to play. It's a next man up mentality. All right, let's dial into the game today. Uh, you got to deal with Christian McCaffrey. You got to deal with Baker Mayfield. Let's start with those two. Not to mention DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson. Anderson is a former Jet, who's a big play guy. But let's start with let's start with the quarterback Baker Mayfield, who um, you know you've seen from your AFC days. But what are some of the things that has jumped out about him on tape that you know he's a nice fit for this team? Yeah, again, I've had a, a lot of familiarity with Baker that, that goes back to the pre-draft process. Uh, when we were getting ready to select the quarterback, have a tremendous amount of respect for him. He has a live arm. He can make every throw. You know, he's athletic. He can get out of the pocket. He can take the, you know, the first play that's called, and if that doesn't go well, improvise and turn it into a second play. So our defense is is going to have to be on our toes with that. And and relative to their skill players, they got they got very very good skill players. You know, Robbie can take a distance. You know, he is a fast fast football player. We got to do a good job of staying on top of him. And then McCaffrey, obviously, that starts with him and, and how they want to utilize him and get him the ball, which is a wide variety of ways. Uh, very good in space, tough to tackle. DJ Moore is the same way. They're, they're just strong runners that have good run after catch skills. We're going to need 11 hats to the ball, and we're going to have to tackle well. Yeah, and even last week they hit a big play with the tight end on a busted coverage. So, I mean, they, they have the capability. They had two pass plays of over 30 yards. You go to the other side of the ball um, – Cleveland had a little bit of success running the ball against them, but it was week one, and I think they've talked in Carolina, some of it just a function of poor tackling. Sure. Just talk a little bit about what they do defensively that has impressed you. Well, I would say that they're a very, very fast unit. They fly to the ball. they got great team speed. Uh, they're tough to block up front. You know, Derek Brown is a load. Burns is an exceptional off-the-edge player. Shaq Thompson is very, very fast, elusive. Luvu is, is a, a, a kind of a jack-of-all-trades. He's very good. He's been you know, lined up in a few different spots. And then a young secondary, but Chin and Horn and, and Jackson are, are really good cover players. Uh, you know, I think they'll, they'll probably mix quite a bit of man in there and, and throw some zones. And you know, our guys are going to have to do a good job of, of trusting their fundamentals and techniques and, and beating the one-on-ones. Coach, obviously in these early stages of the season, um, it's the national fake you out league. You know, one week's result uh, can look completely different the following week. It, you know, is that something that, you know, you as a staff have certainly been alerted to? It's like, all right, you know, Cleveland, uh, Carolina didn't tackle well last week, but we know in the NFL there's marked improvement between week one and week two. Yeah, I think it's just a healthy respect for the team you're playing and competing against every week. Uh, the players, the coaches, the support staff, you know, they're all at the top of their profession. And really one week doesn't have anything to do with the next week. If you go out there and you don't perform well, you're probably not going to win and, and get the results you want. So our focus is really on what we can do during the week and then taking it play by play during the game and doing the things we need to do on a consistent basis all the time to give ourselves a chance um, to get the results that we're looking for. But our focus is on the process of, of what we need to do. Coach, we appreciate a couple minutes. Uh, best of luck against the Carolina Panthers, and we'll do it all over again next week. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate you. And that's it for Friday's edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. I'm John Schmelk. As a reminder, we have this format of show coming your way every Friday this year. So it'll be a player interview with a little bit of game preview stuff in there, but mostly it's more of a you know, bigger look at the player, the team, and more of a regular podcast interview with the player. Then you'll get your hardcore preview with the person that covers the opposing team. And then, you know, Bob Pop with Brian Dable as well. So make sure you stay tuned to the John Siddle Podcast. Every Friday we'll have this episode. We have our rapid reactions after the games on Sunday or whenever the game happens to be. If it's a Monday or Thursday night, we'll have a rapid reaction immediately after those games. And then, of course, we have our midweek episode, which can be a historical thing. Like this week we had... Uh, Eli Manning and Shona Howard preview the Eli Manning show coming your way this week, season two. Uh, we'll try to get some historical stuff, as I mentioned, and national reporters. You know, we'll we'll try to get those as the Giants play some more national games and uh, get some 
guys that cover the league in, in whole to talk about the Giants and the NFL. Anyway, thanks for being with us on the Giants Little Podcast. Again, the Giants Mobile App Podcast platform is Giants.com slash podcast. I'm Schmelk for Papa, for Meadow, for Tatino, for Coach Dable, for Evan Neal, for Joe Person. We'll see you next time.